and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, <clears throat> and of and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple. The community manager for Open Sesame Games, currently kickstarting a crime. I'm hoping I got pronunciation right. Oh, that's always the first question. So <laughs> we can we can wait. Keep going. The one, the <laughs> one and only Ian McClung. How are you doing today, man? Uh, okay. So I'm doing great. Thank you for having me on, Mildra. Um, uh, a cream is how it's pronounced. Um. And that's actually always our first, like, thing that we have people come up. Is it a crime? Is it a crimey? Is it a Um No, it's a cream. Maybe a creme, if you're feeling particularly fancy. Um, and that's because this game is a French import. Um, we have a lot of games that get translated into the various European languages, but very few make it the other way across the Atlantic. And... Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just happy to be a, be a part of it. I am the community manager, but I also happen to kind of be the, uh, not kind of, I, I was the editor before I was the community manager, and I've also done some supplementary writing and um, just general, like, overall everything. I run the games at conventions, I market the game, I'm kind of the the, the person to talk to about the English edition of a cream. Uh, so thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it's fun. It's funny you met. It's funny you mentioned um, games. Co games coming in from from the oh, from over the Atlantic because that applies to both oceans that me that meet the continental U.S. Uh, since uh, there's uh, there's the guys guys like um, Lion Wing who are going out of their way to try and get a lot of Japanese tabletop translated into into English. And of course, of course, over in Europe, we just ha we had that massive one with. Um, well, I'm not gonna say I'm not gonna say its original name, but we know it now as Dragonbane, um, coming stateside. Right. Dracha et Demonar, or whatever the original was. Um, and to be fair, Free League is probably the most prolific of the European publishers here in the states, um, from what I understand. I'd and say, from what I've seen, <laughs> well, they've they've yet to put out anything. Be they've yet to put out a bad game. I can say that for certain. And I've followed quite a bit of their stuff. the The only not the only not so nice thing I have to say about any of their output was just with the Walking Dead game, and it it was nothing to do with the game itself, but rather the timing. Right. It's it's the timing. Um, I I yeah. There's a lot to be said about zombies and and pop culture. And and all that. Um, well, the comic's but, done. It's it, right, exactly. Um, and uh, and and zombies, I think, have kind of run their course as far as like being hot pop culture. So, I, I honestly, I think it's cool that they did it um, because you know they've done other things like Blade Runner and uh, and uh, Alien. Alien was a really good one. They had the award-winning like stress system in Alien very cool as far as uh systems to poach go and because uh, <laughs> because of that i have i have an alien game i can actually i have an alien rpg i can actually recommend instead of the last one that we had right um but yeah no free league they do they do phenomenal work maybe the timing's off maybe it's not who knows all we know is they, they, they do a great job. And honestly, uh, Open Sesame Games, which is the, the, the company I'm part of, we're kind of hoping, you know, one day along the way to be like Free League, mm -hmm. um, ideally. They're, they're kind of the, the aspiration here for us. Um, yeah, that makes sense. So one of the traditions around here is to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense. So, with that in mind, I'd like you to walk me through your introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Oh, gosh. Um, 
so my initial uh, introduction to role playing games was uh, probably over 15 years ago at this point. Um, no, not 15 years ago. 13 years ago. 13 years ago, I dipped my toes into some 3.5 D&D. It did not stick. Um, nothing stuck until probably, you know, 2014 when 5th edition was released. On a whim, I bought my... Because I had a job. Um, it was my last year of high school. Um, on a whim, I bought myself the uh, D&D 5th edition, you know starter kit and all the accoutrement and I was just like hey my friends are, are nerds they might be interested I called them up they were like yeah heck yeah let's go um, and like I actually know it went into the first my first year of college at that point and so we weren't able to spend too much time playing the game together but a fateful uh, winter break led to us playing a two-week marathon game of fifth edition we, we had started it we got hooked it was done um like we we started playing and we just did not stop for an entire winter break two weeks of just nothing but D D. um and and that's kind of when i knew i was like I, I was I was just there. This is what I enjoy doing. And naturally, uh, as these things happen, because I was the person who had bought all of the uh, you know books and everything, I was also the person who was the DM. I was the one running it. And as is tradition with these kinds of things, I have permanently been the game runner for all of our games ever since. Yep, you're. That's one more forever DM for the list. <laughs> So, yeah, I, I hope that answers your question. Uh. But it, well, since since you're work, since you're the hype man for Open Sesame, this, for for all intents and purposes, um, I don't think it's unfair of me to say that you likely, um, had had jumped had jumped around between different between different systems. You weren't a one system lifer. Oh no, absolutely not. Um, I actually grew disillusioned with fifth edition before it was cool. Um, yeah, yeah, keep so adjusting to, so your hipster sunglasses. I I will actually. No, I I saw the writing on the wall way beforehand. I had actually already become kind of frustrated with the fact that, like, my players in my group are munchkins, for lack of a better term. They're not as bad as some people I've seen online. Um, but they, they get close every now and then. It's not a case um, of I, that guy. Right. It's not a case of that guy so much as a case of, well, they're just power gamers. They're not going to be taking every advantage. They're not going to be interrupting me uh, for, for exposition. They actually do enjoy story segments and things like that. But they also like having optimized characters. And it was around that time that I realized that 5th edition they hadn't even bothered balancing the classes against one another, which is arguably more important than balancing, you know, the players versus the monsters, which, I mean, is a whole other complaint people have with the 5th edition system. Um, I have seen and, some it, people claim that balance is not necessary for a TTRPG. I remember John Wick tried to make that cl um, claim, and personally speaking, I find that claim to be bollocks. I Think it's, I think it's a little more nuanced than that. Um, balance is ultimately what your table is going to make of it. And, you know, it's helpful for the person running the game to know whether an encounter is actually going to be fatal or not so that they can, you know, maybe signal that to the players before they make a fatal mistake. Is this a lead um, into the problems of CR? Uh no, it's the, no no no. I'm not I'm not I I don't want to get into any of that. Um, I I do I do just want to like clarify the 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 nuance on on balance. Um, in that ultimately though, I don't think it's important that you have monsters balanced against the players. The players will always find a creative solution to an overwhelming problem, or at least they should. Um, where I find a lot of games. Especially, you know, the more ones with a tactical bent, like 
in particular 5e will kind of run into pitfalls is that you have trap options in character creation so you have you know if you're going to balance just one aspect of your game the thing you should balance is the choices the players will be making for their characters themselves right you want each character each player regardless of their choice of character archetype or what have you um, to feel like they ha have an equal say in the story to the other players um, you don't want any player being you know kind of out of the loop simply because of the choices they made during character creation which will happen if you choose monk or maybe ranger barring a few um, particularly powerful builds um, in in fifth edition um, this is I can I can definitely see that especially since some um, there's a there's a little bit of a conundrum that I poked fun at back in third edition and it's been carried over into fifth and that is what I like well originally it was Godzilla um, in third edition, cleric or druid. In right. fifth edition, it's cow. It's um cowzilla, cleric or warlock. Basically, um, the if somebody knows what they're doing with either of those classes, they can be an entire party by themselves. Right. And it the I find and it's funny. It's funny you mentioned the whole out of the loop thing because. That can ve that can very easily happen with how D and D has handled sp has handled casters for the longest time, uh, where they where they are where they are so ridi so ridiculous in the problem solving department that they're dipping into other people's turf. Right. Um. Which fortunately we don't have those problems in a cream. Yep. Um, <laughs> to bring it back home a little bit. Um, I don't know how much you've read about the game I've so got, far. I've gotten, a f I've gotten a fair bit. Um, so um, I think what I think one of the, one of the key one of the key things to ask about, and may maybe this is some maybe this is something you can answer. Maybe it's something I would have to take up with the de with the devs directly, but. As I understand, as I understand it, you're using a two a two d six system. Um, Correct. Were Were you ever given any indication as to what as to what made the developers pick two d six for their approach? Um, I'm fairly certain it's uh, it's it's kind of stated in um some of the marketing copy that has stayed with the game since we we finalized the starter kit. Um, or not even marketing copy. It's it's written, I think, in the starter kit um, at a certain point about how uh, the game will always favor play characters uh, with skill rather than luck. So 2D6 was a very intentional decision um, so that you would have that nice bell curve, right? Your average roll is always going to trend towards 7. You're very rarely going to get the extremes of 2 or 12. Um, to kind of compound that, uh, characters in a cream have skills. Uh, we have a very tight skill list, 15 skills under three categories, mind, body, and social. Um, and, you know, those numbers are going to make a big difference on whether or not you succeed and also how consistently you succeed. Because again, we have that bell curve. So if you have a plus five to something, which starting characters can have a max of plus five to a single skill, and then if they choose, they can invest another point to get a specialization, which just gives them a permanent plus two to a specific case under that skill. So say, um, you know, I, I've got a plus five in my athletic skill, and I took a plus two in running. So whenever I'm trying to run away or chase or just run around, I get a plus seven to that role. So I, as the player, can can rest knowing that most of the time, I'm going to get a 14 or more on most of my athletics checks, which is phenomenal, actually, because 
you know, the average difficulty for rolls is going to be 10 or 12. Mm -hmm. Now, with that, in, with that in mind, I think the... The next thing, I, the next thing that I do find, um, that I do find it, I do find interesting is that the way difficulty is presented, because in in a lot of cases, it's you're rolling to, it's your difficulty is written as what you're rolling to beat, whereas in this case, it's the subtraction and what and, and whether the, um, whether the to whether the total is above or below zero is the deciding factor. Which is certainly an unusual ap approach. Uh yeah, it's it's unusual in how it is in the in the starter kit. Um and and we we do that uh to kind of focus on margins. You can still do, you know, your target number is 14 and if you roll 14 or more, you're you're going to succeed. But the game likes having degrees of success. We like having um, the ability to say, you know, okay, if your margin of success is plus two, then you might get a little extra. Or if your margin of failure was minus two, then you might have some consequences going. And so that's why there's the focus on subtracting the difficulty from the total so that you know then the margin. And that also makes combat a little bit easier, but you can still do all of your, like, all of your numbers off of the the target difficulty rather than you know subtracting to find zero mm. um it's it's just kind of a different way of thinking about a fairly familiar concept yeah i can certainly get that now with with that in mind i would like i i would like to delve a little delve a little bit into um character creation since that's not covered in the in the playtest kit. So, when I initially looked at the at the sample character sheet, I had I had figured, okay, we're pro we're probably going to be dealing with a a point based approach because of how we're dealing with skills and we're not dealing with with attributes. But you are I correct. also see, which the only other game I can think of that's that is doubling down on sk on skills only in the in this sense that I've covered is the upcoming edition of Heavy Gear. Oh, interesting. Oh, but what? But then, um, then right at the top, I see we I see we have a le a leveling approach. So, is it a case where you're getting a number of points e every time you level up, or is it or is it a different is it a different approach when it comes to advancement? Yeah, so you basically start with thirty points to invest in skills mm -hmm. um, at level one, um, and then as you like level as you level, you gain um, you you gain points that you can then further invest into things. Um, and and experience is actually a thing that we've really left to just the books themselves, which, I mean, the player's guide is complete at this point. We have it available um, on request for reviewers and such, um, and it kind of goes deeper into those experiences. But uh, if, I, if you want, I can um, summarize. Uh, you gain experience in a cream by ending a game session, ending an adventure, ending a camp a camp or ending a campaign um you can also get uh experience for confronting your spleen which is kind of you know one of uh, the bane of your character's existence it's something they do not handle well at all um and confronting it would simply mean you know it gets invoked uh by the conductor the the game master and then you know, you just, you, you roll with it. And maybe you'll succeed, maybe you won't. I really love it when people succeed on this roll, because it's like, you know, their character's overcoming this thing that they do not handle well, etc. Um, and, and, and so you get an experience point for that. Um, you also get an experience point for um, respecting your ideal. So, 
characters also have an ideal, which is kind of their guiding light. It's a guiding principle in their life. It's a thing they won't let go, and they'll always fight for. And if they, you know, make sure try to make sure that that's respected, you get experience at the end of the session. Um, physical growth, of course. It, so, like, if you take time um, to kind of highlight training and, and practicing in in the actual game and story. Um, mental growth, of course, you know, being investigative, etc. Social growth, making new acquaintances, building a new social network, etc. Or inner growth, it, you know, uncovering secrets can also give you experience. So during any given play session of a cream, if you have a particularly good session, um, you should be looking at maybe five or six experience points hmm. per session per player ideally um and then you just use those points to invest into your skills um skills always cost the amount of the next level mm -hmm. after after you after you've init done your initial skill point investment for 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 starting out like those we just give you one to one um but after that you have to pay the value of the next level in the skill. Specializations are the same. It's a it's a five point cost for a plus two bonus, um, but it, it's locked in um, because technically experience is uh, experience does erode over time. So so if you haven't specialized in a certain skill you have to actually um you know invest again to get it back up to a certain level above five um so so it, it's basically a use it or lose it system we want you to be locking in specializations specializing your character kind of choosing your niche and then from there you know, you can you can really find like success and, and high high points. But if you're the kind of person who just wants to say, nah, I'm going to invest all my points and just trying to get you know a few certain skills to ten without bothering to do anything else for it, or you know specializing my character or earning it in other any other way, then the game actually has built in because of the way it counts experience and stuff. It it'll penalize you for that. It's like okay, you're at ten. But because you don't have, um, but because you don't have like any specializations in that, then you know you're going to lose uh, points for every point you have above five um, without a specialization. So, so yeah, if you don't have any specializations, um, and say you have a skill level of eight. It'll you'll receive three negative points, bringing you back down to five. Mm -hmm. So the f the follow up with that would be concerning traits. Yes, traits are actually my favorite um, part of this entire system, uh, personally, mm -hmm. um, because it's entirely up to players to define. Okay. Like, yeah, please. <laughs> now, given that, um, that does sound like something that I've referred to as blank check design, and this is this is where things get tricky. Um, blank, the idea of blank check design is the is the idea of it being well a blank that the players and G and GM are meant to fill in, and a question that I often have. A issue that I've had with some games that do this is not giving proper guidance as far as what is a good or what is a good or bad use of that blank check where the line is and so on. Right. And I do have to I do have to ask if that it if that's something that's addressed with a cream. Uh. So yes, we do have moments of blank check design. And I, in my opinion, the designers, uh, Al Alexandra uh, Clavel and Samuel Mensner, um, I think they did an excellent job of addressing it uh, personally. Um, so 
for example, uh, traits we give they give we simply give a lot of examples for what good trait for for traits between uh, example characters, examples in the text, just kind of reading the book. You you do end up getting a feel for what a trait is, and traits are essentially just characteristics of your character that you want to focus on when you're role playing them. So if you have a character that's you know just super strong. You can totally just write in a trait saying strong plus two, and that's it. Um, you could also say, you know, I've got a lot of underworld connections because that's the kind of guy I want to play. So you can write in underworld connections plus one plus two. Traits can't be more than plus two. Um, any one trait cannot have a bonus higher than plus two. And at char at the beginning of your character, your total trait bonus will be plus two. So you can either have two plus one traits or one plus two trait. You can take a negative trait, um, which is defined by, in the book, we, we literally tell you, to, to know whether a trait is negative or positive, ask yourself if you would want to have it. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's really up to kind of the personal, like, a, a personal judgment call, right, at that point. Uh, and, and different people might have different ideas of what's good or, or bad or what kind of traits they would want or not, and that's totally fine. Um, we Players are encouraged to, you know, play this character to their character's strength. Like, if I'm going to say, actually, no, I want to be ugly. I want that. You know, like, I'm just going to write in just generically ugly, and I'm going to give myself a plus one for that. That opens some really interesting avenues later on for how you're playing that character, right? Because the way traits work are they're essentially the things that you're going to be trying to add to every relevant role. So that earlier example of strong, right? Every time you're doing something with athletics, you're going to be like, okay, and do I get my strong on this? And the, the, the conductor will be like, yeah, um, you, you know, you're trying to lift this gate, you know, open it up, etc. You know, it, it totally goes for you. Um, <clears throat> and similarly, you know, in, in the ugly example, if I wrote that down as a plus, you know, I'd be like, hey, I'm trying to convince this guy to have pity on me. Does that work? And, it's, and you know, the, the conductor would be like, okay, yeah, you get, a, you get a plus one because, you know, they'll have pity. Or, you know, whatever example you might have. But if you want plus three total traits, you have to take a negative. And so another negative, for example, would be like, you know, something like corrupt. Um, or looks down on the lower classes. Yeah, they can be phrases. You can have, as long as like a short phrase or something that kind of gets the point across, traits really have kind of an open thing. Like, um, you know, actually, do you have any character ideas? Uh, when you mentioned ugly as a positive, the, the immediate thing that came to mind was um, Corporal Knobs, Knobby Knobs, in the Discworld books, <laughs> because okay, if you're not from if are you, are you familiar with the Discworld books first? I'm familiar with I'm familiar with Discworld, but unfortunately, I've I've not read any of the books yet. I it's on my short list. Um, the please gag tell with, me who Corporal Nobs is. He is a he is a city he is a city watchman in Knockmork Fork, who is certainly a bit conniving. He is also so ugly that he has official documentation to prove that he's human. And what you just described are two traits. Those are two character traits. Conniving? So ugly he has proof he's human. He, ha he has he has people he has to have uh, he has to have official paperwork so that people know that he's human. That's how ugly that's how ugly he's described. And Admittedly, that's one of those things that doesn't come that doesn't come across as well in the t in the um, TV special adaptations of things like The Color of Magic or Hogfather Knight. But in all fairness, you need a lot of makeup in order to make that gag work. It's one right. of those it's one of those gags that works better in text than it does um, in live action. 
Right, because live action will never do anyone's, uh, you know, imagination justice. Um, now, the question is, do those traits work in his favor or against him? Or which of those tra traits work more in his favor and which of those traits works more against him over the course of the book? Uh, I would say... Sorry, sorry about that. I had to, do, had to deal with a bit of a bug issue. I, I would say that conniving would work for him and the ugliness would work against them, but the the thing about both of them is I can't argue one is in is more po is more positive than negative. The there could be an argument um e depending on the situation for either for either way. I mean, yes. On one hand, on one hand, nobody. On one hand, nobody's gonna trust the backstabber. On the other hand, um, the backstab, the backstabber is gonna be the equip, the equivalent of the of the adage, the young man knows all the rules, the old man knows all the exceptions. Exactly, and that that brings me to my other favorite rule about traits, whether it's positive or negative, depending on the situation. The conductor might choose to turn them on their head, which is def, def that definitely avoids one potential issue because a lot of times in games that have those ne have those negative traits, it's it's when it's all when it's negative exclusively and not open to interpretation, um, it can it can be a harder sell to actually get people to buy into those traits, right. Oh. And here in a cream, everything is open to interpretation. Yeah. Um, more, more or less. Not, not everything, everything, but especially the traits. Mm -hmm. So if you have, say, a positive trait, like just absolutely massive, you know, you you could you could write in plus two, absolute unit, massive lad. Um, that could just be your trait. That's your character. You just want to play this massive Hulk, right? As a G as a GM, I already know how I would work that again. How I'd have that work against them. Exactly. The moment there's any kind of tight space or hallway or anything, sorry, that plus two is now a minus two. I don't need. I don't um, even need to do that. I could. Ha I could have it that he has a, that he he's gonna have a hard time fitting in certain places because some because some er some areas of a location are gonna are going to have going to expect certain attire and. Speaking from personal experience, it is very difficult. It can be tr it can be tricky to get to get clothes that fit when you're a big guy. Exactly, and that's I think kind of the the heart of the brilliance of leaving it kind of free form like that. Because not only does it kind of give the players permission to really make their characters to to define their characters based on kind of you know the the literary nearly almost literary character that they're going to be it also allows the conductor the game master to the the leverage to kind of you know mess with those traits when the uh when the time uh for it comes and because we've already written these things down because you know we've already codified them we've already agreed that this is part of the game it makes it all the easier to simply accept them in the fiction when it does happen like that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's really great. Yeah. Um, another part of the carte blanche uh, game design that I, I kind of want to talk about now that you since you brought it up, and also I haven't really gotten to talk about it before because we've been we've been playing these cards really close to our chest our entire Kickstarter campaign so far, like the entire run up to the Kickstarter campaign. Cephaly. Cephaly is the magic system of Ikrim. Mm hmm So since it's the magic system, that that brings in that brings in some interesting questions. So I, that's why that's why I paused. <laughs> first, first thing first things first. Um, I am assuming that it is that it is that you the use of the magic system is resolved through, um, 
resolve through skills. Yes, and you actually get a different skill sheet when you dip into magic. There is a magic-specific skill sheet which you have to invest in at the cost of investing into other skills. So this it, and I'm guessing each skill is a, is a, is, a, is a, would be akin to a to a different discipline of magic, or even analogous to say the. I'm not going to say analogous as a one on, as a one to one, but not far removed from the from the different spheres of magic you see in more ubiquitous role playing games. Uh kind of. Yes, yes. It's it's definitely more free form than most games. We don't have a spell list, for example. No, you, um it, would I be correct in saying what you have is a list of the magic skills and a a few and some bullet points on what you could do with that skit with that magic skill. We do have a little bit more than that. Um, <laughs> but you are on the right track. We are we are pretty like low low crunch, but we have those bullet points under different difficulties. So your magical ability at any given point is going to be based on your ability to pass a skill check. And in order to do that when you're using your magical abilities, you're going to have different effects based on what you roll. If you get less than an 8, you get nothing. Um, if you get an 8, you'll get something. If you get 10, you might have a lar you'll have a larger effect. 12, larger effect. And 14 or more, you'll have a much larger effect, kind of maxing it out. And we give bullet points with examples of what you can do at each tier. But that's but that's about it. So, yes, we're giving bullet points of examples that you can do, but we have kind of broken it down by tier as far as potency is uh, concerned. Now, um, given given that, do you have... Since you're dealing with um, tiers of success like this, do you, have it, do you have bullet points as far as what each tier would represent for e potentially for each skill? Yes. So, yeah, we have them broken down by tier and by skill. And there are five major magical skills, which are explained a little bit more in the, um, in the conductor's manual. But from the rules we have at the very back end of the player's guide, once the players have the privilege of playing a Cephalic character, um, the, the skills are Elegy, which is illusion, essentially, uh, Entelechy, which is your ability to call upon um, your anency, which your anency is essentially your spellcasting focus. Um, Entelechy is more or less your core magic skill. It's basically the one that limits how powerful you can actually be, and you need to advance it in order to kind of generate and cultivate your, your ability. Um, because it represents how in tune you are with your focus and what you can add to it. And there's a lot more actually to the anency. There are things called group anencies, um, which can, which you can use to create a bohem, um, which is actually a whole part of late stage, late game play, um, as player characters kind of realize or, or gain access to these psychic abilities and then start realizing, you know, we can form a better world using them. Um, but that's, you know, we'll pocket that for the moment. There's Mechany, which is also called uh, Cold Cephaly, which gives you power over machines. Um, Psyche, Warm Cephaly, allows you to manipulate the human mind. And Scoria uh, mm -hmm. is divination. Mm -hmm. And those are the those are the five uh, magic skills. And each one, you know, you're going to roll like your standard skill check, and then based on your total, you'll gain access to a certain uh, a certain potency of effect. Okay, next question. What is the is there a certain catch or a certain risk, a la f a la fumbling? Uh, when it comes to spell use, uh, yes. Uh, if if you if you fail too hard, um, you can you can suffer an impact, uh, which is what we have 
you know, as opposed to uh, Im impacts are what we have instead of um, oh, what's it called? Hit points. Um, <laughs> so instead of having hit points, we have impact. And essentially, you can only take so many of a certain level of impact uh, before you heal it. So for each category, physical, mental, or social, you have a list, uh, you know, you have a pyramid, an inverted pyramid of impacts. You get the most superficial impacts, followed by light, then serious, then dire. You only get one dire impact per category. If you get more than one, you're completely out. Um, you might be dead, you might be unconscious, whatever it is, your character is no longer, like, you as the player are no longer playing the game through your character because they are incapacitated. Um, but even one dire impact will give you a minus four penalty to rolls. Um, uh, each serious impact will give you a minus two penalty, and you can take two of those. Mm -hmm. And then your your light and superficial aren't going to give you any kind of any kind of like bad uh, negative penalty, but you know you're going to run out of them fairly quickly. Even though you might look at the list and say, "Oh, I've got four superficial impacts per category, three three light, two serious, and one dire." Once, once all of the bubbles in one of those, um, once all of the bubbles in one of those categories is filled in, any impact in that category is autom automatically upgraded to the next level. And if the next level is all filled in, it's upgraded again. So mm -hmm. your impacts will fill up relatively quickly if you're not careful and if you're rolling particularly poorly or against um, or against the difficulty that's just beyond you. Um, this is more important for like actual confrontations against NPCs and such, you know, mm -hmm. situations where you might be fighting or, you know, arguing your case before a court or perhaps navigating the intrigues of the local gala. Um, and you do have impacts in each category. The physical ones, you can imagine, are self-explanatory. You'll probably take injury, you might lose a limb, um, you know, that's pretty cut and dry stuff. Physical impacts are physical consequences to your physical body. Um, mental, it's a little more nuanced. That can be, that, that can be anything from a panic attack, severe stress, um, it could be, you know, crippling self-doubt because you, like, you know, you tried to argue a point for your academic, uh, for your academic, uh, oh shoot, for your chosen, the, the, the word is escaping me right now. Uh, you're, <laughs> are we sure English is your first language? Uh, it's not, um, <laughs> by technicality, uh, technically speaking, German was my first language, um, but that was when I was a very young child. Um, no, uh, academic discipline, that's the one. Um, or you could, you know, you could have just brought your theory up to review before the, before the board in your academic discipline, and they just eviscerated you. So now you have crippling self-doubt, you know, you took that dire impact, and now to clear it, you have to spend a year on sabbatical uh, rewriting your entire thesis and everything. Um, or, in the case of the gala, you might uh, make a complete and utter fool of yourself before everyone, um, having severely failed a social confrontation, and now you cannot show your face in that city without, be without being derided or booed or laughed at or what have you. Um, so you better probably take some time off and let it, let it cool down. Mm-hmm. Let, give it give it some time for the heat to blow over. Now, with that with that in mind, given how creation is po is point ba is very much point based, I am I am curious if you if you have um, plans to put in some some suggested archetypes or t or templates to ease away from the analysis paralysis issue that can 
crop up in these kind of games. Oh, absolutely. And and actually, those rules are already there. So we've actually already posted the character creation rules in our official Discord and our Cream Wanderers uh, Facebook group. Um, but just the part where it's the the point the point buy system essentially. Mm-hmm. Um, but we have two other parts of that chapter. The f- one one that actually has pre-built archetypes, like you said, and we're actually currently in the process. Um, we've been doing a thing on our social media, our Facebook and Instagram, where we've been previewing the various archetypes. So every time we show off a, a character archetype on social media, that's actually similar to one of the ones in the book itself. Um, and then our third method, um, after you know, the f- totally free form and the archetypes, is actually a guided quiz that you can also roll on. A life path. Um, yeah, essentially a life path. You just choose, you know, a few different categories of questions. You just pick, pick the the answer you want for each one, or you roll a die, and it'll give you a character pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. So with now, obviously, doing a do, doing a set doing a um a bestiary in the, in the traditional sense would would be would be a bit redundant give, um given the narrativist um approach with this but i am curious if you have some suggested templates for gms to build around uh yes we do the the conductor's manual has several templates um the adventures the scenarios will have templates for various um, important NPCs. So important NPCs actually have stats that look like the players, mm-hmm. and it's pretty easy to write those write those down shorthand. Um, whereas the extras, the you know background characters, they essentially just get three values: physical, mental, social, and that's it. And then you just have to add that value to seven. And that's the difficulty the players have to roll against to beat that particular character. Yeah, I, rem- um, I remember a lot of narrativist games be- um, back in the day having it where the um, creation setup for NPCs and PCs was exactly the same, which could end up creating some is- some issues, especially in freeform games where where um, there's not a whole lot of guidance in term in terms of uh, in terms of making it so that you're not dealing with a set of a set of opponents that's going to curb stomp the party when that wasn't intended. Right. And and we, I think we sidestep that pretty well um, here by just having pretty basic values for the the various and sundry extra NPCs that exist, and then you know having a little bit more detail about the uh, NPCs that are more important to the plot. Um, and yeah. so we offer that. Uh, there in the bestiary, there is also uh, <laughs> there are also cream monsters. There are monsters that come from the acid seas that cover the planet at this point in this setting. Um, things that the human eye was not prepared to see. Um, now, since this is an adap- this is technically an adaptation of um, Matthew Gabriot's books, which I I apologize for mispronouncing the name, <laughs> but I am I am cu- I am curious if could you see could you see somebody um, picking up a cream and you and um that being a gateway to actually reading the source material. Uh, absolutely. Um, the the game is heavily inspired by his work. He was part of writing it, um, and ultimately, you know, the, the the entire setting is kind of his brainchild. Um, but that being said, the adventures that the the characters have are going to be completely their own, um, and. <laughs> Sorry, where was I going with that? I have no idea. 
I I don't know. I, sorry, I was there. There's a distracting cat in here. Um, I, <laughs> I got, isn't I that redundant? Distracted. It is redundant. Um, yeah, cats are always distracting. So Matthew Gabbert's books, um, absolutely, it is absolutely a pathway to reading them. I right, that's what I was doing. Mm -hmm. It is absolutely a pathway to reading them, but you shouldn't exist thinking there is a predetermined correct path in a cream there is definitely like a progression so to speak a, a natural progression that we expect of any given story or arc in which you are discovering the secrets of the world and then becoming part of something greater and then you know the threats kind of increase in size as you know any long form campaign might have uh, but the details and the drama of any given any given party are going to be their own. Mm -hmm. You're going to be able to tell so many different stories within the overarching, uh, you know, o the overarching structure. Um, it's it's just really fun. Yeah. Although um, I did some digging around to see if I could find the original novels that look, unless I'm mistaken, those haven't been translated yet. Nope, there's two. They haven't been translated um, because technically one of the uh, founders of Open Sesame Games, um, Kurt McClung, he helped um, publish the game back in 96, 94, whenever the, the last edition of Akreem was, was, was made. Um, because he originally helped publish it, he actually had the translation rights for it. We did not publish the novels, so those translation rights belong to another company. Um, so we... I don't know how much power or influence we could exert in getting those novels translated to English. I personally think it would be really cool. I can't read French, so that would be awesome, but... You know, I'm not going to hold my breath for it, because we do have this awesome world right here. Um, and that'll be fun enough. Well, I had, that, that'll I had to be put, fun enough for me. I had to put up with filling in the blanks when it came to uh, when it came to Anima because so much of the material wasn't tra wasn't translated into English. Same with um, a go same with Agone, which is also a, which is also a um, French RPG. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, uh, Agon Agon Agon. I've seen that one. Yeah. Um. It is very Midsummer Night's Dream insp inspired. It get it, um, it put the it made me reassess how I v how I view the concept of bards and the whole mi music as performance thing because that's the entire magic system in that thing. Um, mm. And the as well as the even though I repurposed it for some for something else, the idea of ma of magic police known as censors. Oh, right. And there there were a few things that got that that got um, brought to the states, but there was a whole lot more that didn't. But are you familiar with the concept of appendix N? Of course, and. I the cream has an extensive appendix then, because um, given given the fact that until until the novels are tr are translated, um, obviously we can't use that for the appendix end. But what other me what other media, whether it be music, whether it be books, whether it be film, and so on, would you say fits the appendix end for a cream? Whoa, I've been waiting for this question for a while. Um, oh, man. So, Cream's Appendix N includes a lot of novels, most of which I think are French, um, as well as, like, we, we haven't even finished translating the Appendix N because it's like the tail end of the conductor's manual, the, the game master's manual. Like we're two thirds of the way of the total translation project for it. Um, we're just finishing up that final one third. Um, but unfortunately that one third is where the majority of it is. But 
as far as the appendix N and, and various name dropping that we do within the conductor's manual for getting the, the tone, we do have some pretty firm um, uh, uh, ideas of what to expect. Uh, Ikrim is predominantly a dark fairy tale style of game. Um, we reference vamp uh, White Wolf's RPGs like Vampire the Masquerade, Mage, and Changeling. <laughs> oh um, God, Mage! <laughs> yes, no, Mage the Ascension, <laughs> the game, the game that be the game that bends reality over. Yes, and that is the ambiance of the second to last tier of gameplay. Um, the The final tier of gameplay draws from Dark Earth or Agon. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the second level of gameplay we're going to be drawing from, again, low level Vampire the Masquerade Cult, or Call of Cthulhu mm -hmm. um, and, uh, yes. and Call of Cthulhu Cult, if the... you're familiar sorry I'm, I'm very Cult. familiar with Cult it is, <laughs> it is Call of Cthulhu except you can win correct <laughs> <laughs> um and then, of course, the the first, and of course, the first tier of tier of play, which most people are familiar with, the names we drop, as far as similar games are concerned, are not what you'd expect. They are Shadowrun or Cyberpunk. Given um, that, given that there is a heavy steampunk aesthetic, I I could certainly see it. And well, when Fasa came back, they did they did what was what was essentially a steampunk Shadowrun in. Um, in eight in um, 1872. Right. Um, it's just that instead of using the massive die pool, it uses the step system that was already in Earth Dawn, which they still ha which they still have access to. Okay. Um, and I have to correct myself. 1879 was the name was the name of the year, but it is do it is doing that similar presence of. That's that similar motif of magic is returning to the world and every and it's making it everybody else's problem. Yes, that that that's the exact motif there. Um, because players do not start with knowledge of magic at all. Actually, it's recommended you do not give the players any kind of options to make magical characters to begin the game, to begin playing the game. That's something that you allow them to do either level into or allow them to make characters with magical capabilities after they've actually played the game a bit and understand what it's about. Um, moving away from other tabletop role-playing games, um, as far as Appendix N is concerned, Tim Burton's uh, Batman series. Actually, Tim Burton is a great one to reference overall between Edward Scissorhands, um, Big Fish, uh, you know his his Batman especially. Does this um, mean I'm gonna have those... to start playing Tim Burton Bingo? <laughs> like, do I do no. I have to do I do the free space if I if I end up referencing <laughs> Helena Bonham Carter? Oh, <laughs> I, there I may just... or may not there may or may not be characters and NPCs based on Helena Bonham Carter. I cannot confirm. <laughs> um... <laughs> yeah, I I just had to get that joke out of my system or the. <laughs> I I end up watching I end up watching a mini doc about the super about the Superman project that he and Nicolas Cage were in that never came to be. Oh um, my god! Which was going to lead into a world's finest f film that was going to cross over that version of, um, of Superman with the with the Schumacher bet with the Schumacher era Batman. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that probably would have been an absolute disaster, but it'd be a car crash that'd be worth watching. Right. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, Terry Gilliam's Brazil. Mm -hmm. If you're familiar with that. Oh, yeah. Um, that's a pretty big one. Um, other than that, I, I a couple video games that you can draw just kind of ambiance or mood from. Um, would be Dishonored and Disco Elysium. I was also going to ask if Thief would would count, would count, but Dishonored is in the same um, in the same ballpark, kind of. Absolutely. 
Um, and I can. I it's definitely it's definitely something I can I can see. And the the big reason I brought up Thief is be is because Thief Thief isn't full on steampunk in the way a lot of people right. think it is. It is a it is a fantasy setting that just happens to have electricity, and right. ha and mainly has it because of the because of the Hammerites and later the later the Mechanists. As annoying as they as they <laughs> as they are, right? But there are uh, there are other factors as well, like like say the like like say the Woodsy Lord, which I'm not which um. I know some people would say, "Isn't that spoiler?" The game is the game is over twenty years old. Um, we have cross we have crossed the threshold when it comes to spo when it comes to spoilers. The statute has run the statute has run out. <laughs> but you have you have the fact that one of the big conflicts in Thief was between the people who um, followed the followed the more pagan. Approaches versus the Hammerites, right? And so you essentially have the you essentially have the new ways and the old ways in co in conflict with each other. Although it's, I'd hesitate to I'd hesitate to say it's one it's one bad other good, and that's not even getting into the Watchers, which is a whole other kettle of fish, but, right? And that, and given that given that. I can't help but get the feeling that since since you mentioned um, stuff like Cyberpunk, stuff like Shadowrun, um, Dishonored, and the like, one common thread I'm seeing with a lot of these is that instead of trying to depict the whole world, it hyper focuses on one particular city where you could do whole campaigns without leaving. Yes, absolutely. Um, so Ikrim. Like and actually, an, there's an entire series of scenarios um, based around the city of Venice, mm -hmm. um, which is similar to the Venice that exists now, except instead of canals filled with brackish water, they're filled with deadly acid. Um, because again, a cream mm -hmm. it covers the entire Earth at this point. Um, so, yes, most games will focus probably around. A specific area unless due to a certain circumstance you have to go to another um, and in this case we're looking at things like I guess uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula or Mary Shelley's Frankenstein uh, mm -hmm. definitely pull from those uh, the poetry of Baudelaire um, uh, the to, to get back into Appendix N the poetry of Baudelaire the writings of Charles Dickens um, you know, if you want to bring in an American influence, you could probably do some Mark Twain or Edgar Allan Poe. Um, that that all, uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, of course, and Bram Stoker's Dracula, definitely draw from all of all of that. And then, of course, kind of fit it with very French steampunk, very Art Nouveau uh, essence overall. Mm -hmm. um, and that's and that's where you get a cream. And so we do focus generally. We will end up focusing probably on one single single city. Um, and scenarios do do that, of course, because you know it's pretty. You know, it's, it's an easy way to make sure that the scenarios are interconnected. It's a good way to call upon you know characters that you already loaded. And you know, it's it's just fulfilling from a storytelling standpoint. That being said you're not necessarily going to be limited to a single city based on what your group is doing. Um, personally, I think a cream is a great setting in which to do a bullet train or even snow piercer style uh, campaign or at least section of a campaign. Um, ah, shoot, I keep adding to the appendix end. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah. With Cyberpunk, with Shadowrun, you're essentially going to be playing the underdogs, more or less, and you're going to be fighting against um, the various inequities that exist within the world. And I, I think that's a very important thing to point out about Kareem, is that 
between the ecological disaster that was the Akrim, the authoritarian governments that are trying to control what you know people do and and say, um, the scientific lodges that want to have a monopoly on research and knowledge, the merchant concerns that simply wish for unbridled trade and free markets and you know control through those. Um, things are looking pretty grim for the common person, um, especially if you're particularly poor. And that's, again, that's where we pull in the Dickensian thing. So this isn't an idealized steampunk. This isn't the kind of steampunk where we're like, ah, yes, God save the queen. I'm part of the Royal Navy. Yes. No, this is the type of steampunk where we're saying, you know, the common people are in danger. Industrialization has changed things, and not necessarily for the better. Um, and you are seeing that, um, you know, from the front lines. We don't have, you know, people who are proudly serving their country going to war. We have people who are completely disillusioned by the war that they served in 10 years ago. Um, you know, because in the current setting, in the narrative present of a cream, uh, the acrimony wars happened 10 or 20 years ago, and they were essentially this world's equivalent of World War I. Um, there was, it was a huge, you know, it was a huge war. Nation, entire nations changed, essentially, by the end of it. And now, unlike like our World War I, at least, it's more in the latter part of World War II, um, now the world prefers to play a more subtle power game where everyone's trying to, you know, use their spies and influence to gain power over each other. Um, and that's the narrative presence present that we find the players in. So it's a very punk, it's a very grungy approach to steampunk, more or less. Um, yeah, I can, I can certainly get, I can certainly get behind that. Um, Though when when you mentioned when you mentioned a bit more grungy, um, something that did come to mind was Iron Kingdoms to a certain extent. Uh no, Iron Kingdoms are way too technologically advanced. Yeah, that's the for, that's the reason for good why comparison. I, that's the reason why I shot it down in my head. In my head, it only showed up for a for a second. But um, what would you be shooting for as far as a page count for the books? Uh, the page count of the books, the player's guide currently weighs in at 240 pages. Um, and the, and it contains everything you need to know to play the game as a player. It contains, you know, character creation, all the stuff about the skills, characters, etc. All of the lore about the world that's going to be readily available. Um, and, you know, the rules about spell casting and, and all that, Stephalie. Um... <laughs> Then the conductor's manual currently weighs in. It'll come in around 120, maybe 160 pages, depending how the campaign goes. Because something we're trying to do for the Kickstarter is if we do well enough, we actually want to take some of the expansion content um, from the French edition of the game. Um, that was a, you know, a separate book that you'd have to buy separately. We're trying to take some of the expansion content and integrate it into the core rules. For the English edition, um, and so depending on how the campaign goes, it can be anywhere between 120 and 160 pages. Mm -hmm. um, and naturally, you know, you might look at these and say, "Well, that's only you know 360 pages of game. What gives?" And all I have to say to that is, it's a narrative style game. Um, we don't have pages upon pages of combat options and skills and feats and weapon traits and spells with, you know, their, their minute everything. We don't have, you know, pages upon pages of just how to maneuver in combat or specific rules for every occasion, right? We're, it's a very narrative game. And so the majority of our page count is actually setting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that tends that tends to track games that are more narrative centric are gonna um, give more give more space to their set to their setting. That's just 
that's just how this kind of thing usually ends up working. But with the, with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the um, particular brand of crazy that happens around here. Yeah, thank you for having me. I, I, I've enjoyed being here. Do you have any other questions that are burning in your skull that you'd like to to get out? <laughs> I think I think I've I think I've covered everything that I'm go that I'm going to be able to cover. Right now, right now, it's just a matter of um of wa of waiting until waiting until I can um dive di dive deeper into things. But I but I am a patient monk. And with that in mind, I would also like to give a sincere thanks to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come all the way to the temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. Remember, folks, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. Thank you so much for having me.